Hello, Wayne here. Um, this is part one of a five-part crime series. Um, I'm going to try to get the rest of them on here tonight or tomorrow. Um, and I also want to warn anybody that's watching this, that viewer discretion is strongly advised. You should, don't want your kids watching this one. It's pretty graphic. But I'm going to click out of the camera and let you guys watch it without me interrupting. See you next time. Uh. They found them. They're dead. Uh. The way he killed them was just horrible. His brutality was just over the top. She screamed until she could scream no more. The state of Texas has never seen a crime like this. This guy was hunting women all the time. He was a monster. I don't think he had any conscience. I just thought he had the coldest, coldest eyes I've ever seen in my life. Satan's son. They released a murderer. He was paroled, freed to kill. He was known as the broomstick killer, and I had to catch him. The system let us down. You may have a guy out there killing tonight. We have to get him back and put him away. It's not safe to be around him. He'll kill you. It's a lonely stretch of Interstate 35 located south of Waco. A dark, isolated place. And there's a dim light coming from a convenience store. Desolate and deserted in the middle of nowhere, pitch black, dark in the middle of the night. A place you wouldn't want your wife, your daughter, maybe not even yourself to work. It was about the only thing on that stretch of the interstate. It was the last stop leaving town and maybe the first stop coming in. Working alone in what was called the graveyard shift was a petite brunette woman, Melissa Northrup. <laughs> a 22-year-old pregnant mother of two children, all alone, nobody watching her back. Melissa was unfortunate to work where she did and when she did. The sad truth of life is that there's a lot of people that have a job they don't want, but they need it. And I think that was Melissa Northrup. She struggled. Her family struggled financially, and so she had the job that nobody wanted, which is working in a convenience store in the middle of the night, right off an interstate highway, which under any circumstances is dangerous. Unless someone happens to drive up to get a tank of gas, nobody's going to be there except the attendant behind that counter. When she has to go back to restock things, she's alone. She doesn't know who comes in the door, and the security cameras don't work. 
she'd like a bell on the door to ring and she's told her mother that the management has told her well you just need to get a hearing aid the night that she left for work just hugging her and telling her i loved her and said be careful we'll see you in the morning didn't see her the next morning so here she is very very vulnerable and because she worked those hours, her husband did check on her. He tried to call her and couldn't get her. He kept trying, he couldn't reach her. That was not right. Around 4.45 in the morning, he tears out down there. And he gets down there, and there's no sign of his wife. No one was in the store. Her purse was there. This is bad. Very unlike her not to take her purse. But even more importantly, she's got this burnt orange Buick coupe. It's gone. No sign of it. Nowhere to be seen. All of a sudden, she's just gone. And I don't know if you can imagine how that feels. I got a call from her husband, and he said, Brenda, is Melissa at home? And I said, no. He said, she's not here at the store, and her car is gone. I said, call the police. And that sets off, then, a search for Melissa Northern. Helicopters are put up, searching the area, no sign of her. She's disappeared in the dead of night, and there is no clue of what's happened to her. Brenda Solomon is Melissa's mother. It eats at you every minute of the day. If we knew something, we want Melissa home. We love her and we miss her. A few days later, Melissa Northrup's car turns up, very distinctive looking, at a gravel pit in southern Dallas County, about 60 miles away. Melissa was a small woman. They find that the driver's seat of the car has been pushed way back for a taller driver. On the very day that Melissa Northrup's car is found abandoned, the owner and the manager of the New Road Inn Motel uh, which is located in Waco, about 200 yards from the convenience store where Melissa Northrop has gone missing, calls the police. Waco PD. And he complains there's a tan Thunderbird coupe that's been sitting out there for two days in the parking oh lot and is blocking the entrance for truckers. Will the police come out, run the registration on the Thunderbird? <laughs> and it's registered to Kenneth Allen McDuff. I was working narcotics cases with City of Waco police and with a couple of my best friends who were U.S. Marshals in Waco, Mike and Parnell, the McNamara brothers. One day, I'd pick them up for lunch and they were standing outside the federal building talking to a very young FBI agent. And just in a casual passing, the FBI agent says, hey guys, does the name Kenneth McDuff mean anything to you? That agent just said they found McDuff's car near where this girl is missing, just south of town. And they stopped dead in their tracks. When the McNamara brothers described to me what he had done in the 60s in Fort Worth, Texas. And that that person, that creature, a serial killer, 
would ever be released from a cage troubled me. That that guy would ever get out of prison, I didn't understand it. The idea that you would parole someone like Kenneth Allen McDuff, it's like something made up in a crime novel. It turns out McDuff had indeed been paroled three years earlier in 1989. When McDuff walks out of prison on parole, Sheriff Larry Pamplin can't believe it. I said, I don't know when, I don't know if it'll be this week, next month, six months, or a year from now. Sooner or later, you're gonna have bodies showing up. In the mid-1960s, Texas was primarily an agricultural state in oil. If you got out of Dallas, you got out of Houston. It was vast, wide open spaces. Most people in Texas did not live in cities. It was just more relaxed way of life. Small towns with main streets. People just were neighborly and took care of each other, and people were very trusting. <laughs> Kenneth McDuff grows up in a small town in central Texas named Rosebud. maybe about 2,000 people. Main town square, where everybody kind of knows everybody, other each other's business. They know people by the first name. Rosebud was an ideal town. You didn't lock your doors at night, walk to town, to the five and dime. Everyone had beautiful yards. It was like Mayberry. The McDuff family is notorious in town. Daddy is a concrete cement finisher. He's making a lot of money. But what they're really known for is Mama McDuff. Addie McDuff. His mother was pretty rough. Kenneth could do no wrong in her eyes. I mean, anything Kenneth done was good. Most people have said, Miss McDuff, was too lenient on him, and when he got in trouble, that he was just spoiled, and that's why he did all the things he did. If he'd get in trouble at school, his old mother would come down there and defend him. Kenneth didn't do no wrong, she'd say. He got called down for misbehaving on the school bus. Addie shows up with her pistol, threatening the driver. They called her the pistol-packing mama. He just never had a negative consequence. As bad as he was, he was worse because his mother encouraged it. Kenneth and his brother are just wild hellions in town. They're known as bullies. They had a threatening veneer to them. Slick back hair in those days conveyed you were a punk. That entire town was terrified of them. McDuff was mean and rotten, even as a boy and as a teenager. I went to Rosebud School all 12 years. Kenneth McDuff was there. We didn't get along at all. So I guess it started the bullying in school, uh -oh. way back there. Because if he could push you, He'll push you around and everything, but he always had to be king of the deal. He always wanted to be in control of the situation. A lot of his meanness was directed at women, including the women in his family. The stories had gone around that maybe he had molested a sister or sisters. 
and that kind of didn't surprise me at all. Women were objects to be abused, and later he would say he would use them up. But if you stood up to him, he would he'd back off. He didn't want no part of it. He just pushed you as far as you'd let him push you. You always do find out when bullies are faced off by somebody, they often are cowards. A classmate of mine had a fight with Kenneth at what we call the smoking bridge. That's where it took place. Right down here. My friend got Mac Duff to empty his pockets. No one trusted him. He had a set of brass knuckles and he had a knife. The fight got started. My friend got the best of him. In fact, MacDuff never messed with a friend again, and it wasn't too long that they said MacDuff had left school. Kenneth MacDuff, you know, he'd get in trouble over everything. In 1964 and 65, he commits a string of burglaries and is arrested. And he laughed it off. All those burglaries, they were just pranks, just out there pranking people. He said, you know, there's a whole lot of kids out there who do the same thing, and they don't go to prison. For all these burglaries, McDuff gets a 52-year sentence, but only serves nine months. On December 29, 1965, 19-year-old Kenneth McDuff is paroled. It ends up being Kenneth McDuff's first experience with the revolving door prison system in Texas. Texas didn't really have enough room, even in those days, to hold everybody that was coming into the system. What you learn is, I can get away with murder. This is a warning to the citizens of Austin. Stay away from the university area. In the months after McDuff walked out of prison on parole, this is the backdrop to what's going on. A boy riding a bicycle has been shot and seriously wounded. Charles Whitman had climbed the University of Texas Tower with rifles. It turned out to be the deadliest mass shooting committed by a lone mass murder in, in history of the nation. That really got everybody's attention. People were stunned by that. few days later. McDuff's out driving around with a guy named Roy Dale Green. McDuff has found an accomplice. He's found somebody that he thinks he can use in Roy Dale Green. According to Green, they were just driving around in a rural part of South Tarrant County. McDuff said he wanted to look around for some girls because he was tired of the girls in his hometown. McDuff's a big talker. And McDuff talks a big game about killing people. He likes killing people. Well, he told me that he was looking for somebody to kill. And I, hell, I never, no, never dreamed I, I'd be involved in murder. McDuff was already bragging about having killed some people before that. It seemed to be something that, that he kind of enjoyed. One of the things he told Roy Dale was that, you know, killing a woman is like killing a chicken. They both squawk. Roy Dale, as perverted and strange as it sound, is impressed by it. He was the kind of a person who thought McDuff was cool and the guy to be around. They drove up to a town called Everman. After a few beers, McDuff got in one of his very dangerous moods. McDuff, and these were his words, was on the hunt. He was on the hunt for victims and on the hunt for women.
like a shark detecting blood. McDuff spots a car parked in a baseball field, remote area. And there are three teenagers there, Robert Brand and his cousin from California, Marcus Dunham, and Robert's girlfriend, Edna Louise Sullivan. Three teens are parked and they're talking, messing around, having fun. They'd tune in their favorite radio station. <laughs> Miss Sullivan was very popular at school, beloved by everyone. Louise, she was very sweet. She loved my kids. She played with my kids when she'd come over to visit with Robert. You could tell they were crazy about one another because that's all they did was just hug and kiss and carry on like young kids do. Robert told me, he says, I'm really crazy about her. He said, I think when we graduate, we might consider getting married. I said, well, maybe you can get married in our house. He said, well, that'd be OK. And there was supposed to have been with them another teenage girl. And she was going to go with Mark that night. But they drove by to pick her up, and she didn't feel well, so she didn't go. So she would have been there, too. And they were alone. No baseball fans, no parents nearby, no roads passing closely. Rodale Green did not know what was getting ready to happen. McDuff has told Rodell Green to stay in the car. He's creeping up on his prey. Kenneth McDuff was on a mission to murder. <laughs> Robert was always home in town. No matter what, he was always home. And Dad didn't rest till his kids were home. He was always home at midnight when I told him midnight was it, you know, that's it. And he always come in on that time. That night, he didn't. So Robert's father and brother-in-law head out in the middle of the night to find him. Maybe he's broke down somewhere. I was probably two or three hours later, they came back. They said they probably ran off and got married. The next day, a fisherman is headed out to fish. It's a rural area, and he's going down this remote road. He's in shock. <coughs> Two boys shot in the head. And Dad came up to me and he said, they found them. They're dead. And that was hard, very hard. I said, where's the mother? And he said, she had to be sedated. <coughs> it didn't happen back there. I just couldn't believe that it had happened. I went up and I identified both boys. It didn't really hit me like it did when I seen them in laying like they was. So me and my wife both, she just went all to pieces. The sheriff starts to investigate and they realize they were out with a teenage girl and she's not there. And now a massive search starts for where is Edna Louise Sullivan. 
There were more than a hundred law officers uh, on that search. All of this was taking place in pretty rugged country. It, it was not easy. And everybody from the small local towns, they join in and they're combing through fields and the woods and ravines and streams looking for her. Roy Dale, meanwhile, is out with friends and they're listening to the radio in the car. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. And then they hear the radio news reports about the murder of these teenagers. And this is big news in this area. This kind of stuff did not happen. Green couldn't hold it in. He just came unglued and told his friends, I, I was involved in this. I had just got to tell somebody about it. And they caught a hold of his mother, and his mother said, you need to uh, turn yourself in. Later that day, Roy Dell Green leads investigators out there searching for the body of Edna Louise Sullivan. Green had kind of a meltdown of sorts and couldn't seem to find his way. They took him back to the jail and he drew some crude maps of where he thought the body was. And they used those maps to uh, finally find her body. Beneath a thicket of oak trees, she is found lying face down, right where McDuff and Green dumped her body. Roy Dale also tells authorities where they might find Kenneth McDuff. <coughs> Sheriff Sonny Elliott of a neighboring county and Sheriff Brady Pamplin of the Rosebud area and Pamplin's son Larry Pamplin, they find out McDuff is out on a date. They're gonna try to catch him as he brings a young woman home. They lay in wait. <clears throat> McDuff spots them. They set off in a chase. It's a gun battle of the sheriffs firing at the car, trying to stop the car. They put rounds into the radiator and other places, and it disables the car. Larry Pamplin with his father, Brady, get right up beside it. And Larry has got a shotgun on him, ready to just put a round into his head. And for years and years, Larry Pamplin would regret that he didn't put a bullet in him right then and there. When McDuff was arrested, he was very docile and he didn't fight. He knew who he could intimidate, and law enforcement officers didn't fall in that category. McDuff has committed three murders. <laughs> he goes out on a date. He's suddenly in a rolling gun battle with the sheriffs. And his concern is, will insurance pay for the damage to my car? Always about Kenneth. in those days when the police began to trust you they would let reporters go with them when they went to investigate things i was in sheriff lon evans's patrol car to pick him up and bring him to the tarrant county jail the only thing that mcduff talked about was the shooting at the university of texas tower mcduff volunteered that guy must have really been crazy. There are certain dates you remember. We remember when Kennedy was shot. We remember when Elvis died. I remember when I was heard that Kenneth had done this. When the details started coming out, you really couldn't believe it. The way he killed him was just horrible. This murder trial is big news. The court is packed, spectators lined up outside wanting to get in. 
I attended the one day of the trial, one day, and there's a lady down the way from us, and she was talking so loud. She said, he's not guilty of this. She said, I will get each and every one of them. Well, that kind of scared me. That lady was Addie oh. McDuff, and that was Kenneth McDuff's mother. And she is there proclaiming the innocence of her son. The security was so tight because there were so many threats they were getting that somebody might might assassinate him. Paul Paul brought a gun to the courthouse. I don't think anybody would have blamed him if he would have shot him. Well, I wanted to kill him. Sure, I wanted to kill him, and a lot of other people wanted to kill him. They took the gun away from him, let him go on in because he had to testify. But he was just a mess. He was going to kill him. And this is the way, over the years, Dad felt. He wanted revenge. I was already a dead man, see, as far as I was concerned, because I lost the only son I had, see. The star witness is Roy Dell Green. He's turned state's evidence. Green had given this lengthy confession, signed it, and uh, was willing to repeat it. He gets on the stand and gives this grisly testimony. McDuff forces all three teenagers into the trunk of the car at gunpoint. Uncle Robert and my cousin Mark and Louise all got in the trunk of my uncle's car. They were all in there together. He has Roy Deal Green follow him, and they go to another remote location. They drove around. I wish I knew what they were thinking. I'm sure they were probably trying to think of a way to get away. McDuff pulls Edna and Louise Sullivan out of the trunk. And he tells Roydell Green, they've seen me. Now I got to kill them. The boys are begging and crying and pleading for mercy of don't do it. Louise was standing there. Roydell Green said, oh, don't worry. He's just going to scare them. This boy in front of me go like this, cover his head. And that's what I did, too. I turned away. Louise, she was there. He shoots one of the boys twice in the forehead, then shoots the other boy in the temple, puts the barrel of the revolver up to his head, and puts another round into him. And every time I take my hand off the eyes to look, he'd shoot. And you could smell gunpowder and blood when he got through. And he tried to close the trunk of the car, but it wouldn't go down, so he backed it up next to a fence. I suppose he thought that nobody would think anything about it. <laughs> McDuff makes Roy Dell Green drive to another location. Meanwhile, he's in the back seat raping Edna Sullivan in all manners imaginable. With a broomstick, he violates the poor girl. He threatens Roydell Green, and he now has to rape the girl. He's got to be part of the crime. Mike Duff raped the southern girl. I got back in, and I raped her. Once McDuff is finished with this, this orgy of violence, drags the girl to the back of the vehicle. And he takes each end of the jagged broomstick that he's violated her with. He can hear her neck and larynx crack. 
and Roy Dale comes in so that McDuff can finish the job. And she was dead. And he slung her over a barbed wire fence like you would a dead rabbit. They take her lifeless body and throw it in a ditch like it's trash and then cover it with brush and really kind of nonchalantly leave. The brutality of the murder of Louise Sullivan was heartbreaking that such a beautiful young girl had to go through such a trauma before being killed. This is just completely evil. When the three kids got killed, I had joined the Navy. I'd get a letter or two from home every, every week. My mother stated that MacDuff had, had killed a little girl with a broomstick and broke her neck. Then she remembered back a few years, Miss MacDuff confided in me at one time that Kenneth was killing her chicken, said he didn't know what to do with him. Said he, he would just take a stick, put it across her necks and watch him die. After torture and rape and three brutal murders, Roy Dale was finally brought back to his home by Kenneth McDuff. Kenneth kept telling him, if you breathe a word of this, I'm going to kill you. He saw the very same person who brutally murdered these three children telling him, I'm going to kill you if you open your mouth. And now, Roy Dell Green has told LaCourt that McDuff violated the young lady with the broken broomstick and then later killed her with a broomstick across her neck. <clears throat> it's unthinkable acts. Nobody can imagine such stuff. Some of the female members of the jury have tears in their eyes. McDuff became known as the broomstick killer. It really upset the community. I still remember it because I think it's the worst thing I ever saw. He was a monster. I don't think he had any conscience. And I remember somebody saying at the time, if there was ever a reason for the death penalty, it was Kenneth Allen McDuff. This trial was front page headlines day after day. McDuff being the, the self-centered psychopath that he is, he tells his lawyer to shut up, he's gonna take the stand. And on the stand, he begins to weave this incredulous story, but he's trying to put the blame on Roy Dell Green. He and I abducted three teenagers and raped the girl and killed them. Man, up, killed them. He's the one that killed him. My own eyes, I seen him kill three. And if that don't call for a death penalty, what does? The prosecutor at the time, Charlie Butts, said when McDuff testified on his own behalf that that was the single biggest blunder he's ever seen in a murder trial because Roy Dale Green had just testified and he was about as pathetic an individual as a person could be. He said, you could tell that he couldn't conceive of doing such a thing, much less carry it out. There's only one person, maybe two people in the court that believe this story. His mother and Kenneth McDuff. I just thought he had the coldest, coldest eyes I've ever seen in my life. Mean, mean looking to me. It only took the jury four hours to come back with a verdict that he was guilty of capital murder. And then a sentence was returned that he would die in the electric chair. My dad was happy, happy. I think the whole family was happy. Daddy called him the devil. He called him Satan's son. 
I was tickled to death. I said, well, thank God, I won't have to kill him. He'll do it himself. And I thought surely they would. It's crime. You kill two people and then rape and torture a woman and then choke her to death with a broomstick. I mean, we'd never heard or seen anything like this. Who would ever imagine at that time when you looked at the heinous nature of their crimes that anyone would ever parole them, that anyone would ever release this man from prison? But it's going to happen. I have to wonder about how did that happen? How did Macduff get out of prison? How did he? Uh, get out of death row for killing three people back in the, in the 60s. The story of how Macduff got off death row and out on parole involves not only the U.S. Supreme Court, but also corruption and political cowardice in Texas itself, and that will take some explaining. In 1989, 23 years after the broomstick murders, Kenneth Macduff is back on the street again. Just three months after McDuff walks out of prison on parole, his parole officer writes a memo warning that McDuff is a ticking time bomb. He's got an explosive temper, and it may go off if the wrong button is pushed. In March of 1992, three years after McDuff's 1989 release, a young convenience store clerk, Melissa Northrup, has disappeared, and authorities fear that oh. Kenneth McDuff has resumed his murderous ways. So he's out, and she's missing. And his car is found, McDuff's car is found yards away. As the investigation unfolds, a witness reports having seen McDuff speeding away. And what got his attention was this petite woman, Melissa Northrup, terrified expression on her face in the passenger seat. She's missing, and we don't know what else. Now, this man was on death row. Now, I want to know why. A man that's sentenced to death is out on parole. If he's got the death penalty, he should not have any chance for parole at all, none whatsoever. So now you have a circumstantial case, <coughs> but it happens to involve a killer, a known killer. What more do we need to get anxious about catching him? Johnston starts building a case for a warrant for Kenneth McDuff. I went with the FBI agent over to the sheriff's office. The lieutenant over homicides said, I don't know, let me call the district attorney. As if he was ordering lunch almost, said, ah, DA says no PC, no probable cause. The FBI Agent, he and I looked at one another and both knew better. And they tell him, look, as we're talking here, he's killing people. And nobody will jump into the fight. So Johnston says, I'm going after him. So I stuck my nose in it and started asking questions around the sheriff's office. And I learned that one of our bail bond <laughs> clerks, her boyfriend hangs out with McDuff and I asked her some questions about her boyfriend and what he did with McDuff. And she said, well, they do this and that, and they get high, and they go, and they what? Oh, they get high, you know, they do some drugs together. And I'm hearing the constitutional basis for federal jurisdiction over a drug case. McDuff has purchased LSD. Bill Johnson sees his opening here, that he could get a drug warrant and a DEA agent writes up an affidavit, and Bill Johnson gets his warrant to hunt McDuff on what he says was pretty flimsy evidence. 
there was no murder warrant for Kenneth McDuff. All we had was a single tab of LSD. Why would we do that? Because he might be out there killing somebody right now.